Welcome to Marriage Underdogs Radio Show. I'm your host, Chris A. Matthews. Once again, I'm excited about our guests. We have Dr. Philip and Rochelle Francis, the owners of Tampa Bay Delivery, LLC. I'm so glad to have you guys on the show today. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. We're happy to definitely, be here. Definitely, definitely. So um, I, I want to jump right into it. There are about four different characteristics of marriage underdogs that I want to highlight that you guys in the um, pre-show conversation we had mentioned. And in the first being um, starting a family in your late, your latter years, 39 for, for you, for instance, 31, Rochelle, can you guys talk about the foundation that needed to be present? to be able to, to have your family at 39 and 31. Cause a lot of times people want to, you know, have this rush, like have kids in the twenties, but you guys were more mature and seasoned. Can you share what that did for you guys to have that foundation? I can go first. I'm going to, I'll start and say, um, as a, from a foundational perspective, we both are rooted in Jesus Christ. Um, and I think any marriage that puts Christ first and knows what they stand for, that's the beginning of any good foundation. Um, secondly, I think being a little bit older, we had kind of gone through our own personal seasons um, with our own families, going through school, kind of getting careers uh, set up. And I, I'm gonna say this, I do hear a lot of people say, I gotta have all these things together first before I ever have kids. I don't know that that's always possible. So at that point, you may be waiting to have kids so you're like 60. Because um, we don't always have it all together. But we were both in a place where professionally we had gone through our schooling, had gotten our careers together, you know, got married. Um, and some some folks' eyes a little bit later than than most. But again, God has his timing. Um, and at the point we're ready to have kids, uh, we were, as you said, seasoned um, in terms of our experiences. Yeah. How about you, Michelle? What, what was kind of your take? Like I'm hearing Francis say, you, you had time to put things together, but for those that are listening, it doesn't necessarily need to be perfect. But when you think of just a dating seasons or trying to figure out what you guys wanted, you must have known because, I mean, you guys, how long did you date before marriage? 11 months. 11 months, right? So, Michelle, from your perspective, like, what was it about Francis and even you in particular as a woman where you knew, okay, this is where I want to be in terms of settling down? Right. So for me, I would have preferred to have gotten married a little bit earlier. You know, I was one of the ones that wanted to be married, you know, college, right after college, get married, start a family. Um, but it did give me the opportunity, like Philip was saying, to, you know, start my career, travel. Um, I spent we spent about a year living in Costa Rica, living abroad, learning Spanish, you know, you know, just moving in and in, in doing what I wanted to do freely. So that was a blessing to be able to do that. Um, as we, you know, kind of got the relationship going, I, let me back up. Even before that, the men that I dated in, in the past, I said, you know what? I am looking for something a little bit more stable. When I met Philip that night, actually, that we first met, I knew that he was going to be my husband. I did not share that with him right away, right? Didn't want to scare him off. Um, <laughs> I knew that he possessed all of the qualities that I had prayed for, for a husband, for a leader. Um, so I knew he was the one the first uh, first night we met. I love the fact that you're talking about intentionality. And when you mentioned prayer, there had to have been a description that you asked God for. So when you met Philip, it wasn't, something that was really a surprise. You just were able to walk into the faith of your prayers. And Francis, you said, and, and for those listening, I call Philip Francis by his last name, so it might be interchangeable. But Philip, <laughs> you you also mentioned Jesus Christ being that foundation. So it was really a spiritual connection. Now, when you segue into the marriage, having three children in, in a, a time frame, so you had Julian, your first at what age, and then your last at what age? I was 39. 41, 43. So we had three kids. We got three boys in three and a half years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that's was, definitely a marriage underdog stat where you have <laughs> two or more within 18 months. Right? right. Your chances of divorce are actually increased by 40%. So the fact that you guys had three within three years, can you talk about that experience? I'm going to let you go. I, I didn't get to actually be pregnant, but I was part of the experience. 
So I'm gonna let her go ahead. Right. Well, again, kind of going back, Philip's family, they, you know, his brothers and sisters are a couple years apart. Where my my sisters and I are about four to five years apart. So I'm thinking that, oh, okay, you know, we'll be in the three to four year, you know, years apart for each child. And Philip's like, no, you know what, we need to just go in there and knock this out right away. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh man, okay, well, you know, what do we do? You know, so it's interestingly enough, when we uh, were preparing to have children, we didn't have children, we were married, and then we did not have Julian until four years into our marriage. And uh, mainly because there were some fertility challenges that we didn't know that we were going to encounter, right? We're in this new marriage. We think that we're just going to have a baby right away as soon as we're ready. And God didn't plan it that way. So I think that in itself helped strengthen our marriage, right? The first real challenge of our marriage was being able to conceive and going through that whole process. Um, so, but I will say that whether you have children three to four years apart or you have them 18 months apart, you know, there's going to be challenges, uh, you know, either way. So, right. but it worked out for us and the boys are super close. They love each other and, you know, it's worked out. I'm so glad you mentioned the fertility piece because uh, in the work that I do with couples as a counselor, that is an issue that really puts a strain, especially on a new marriage when you think you're going to go in and just have these children and you have this plan, but God allowed there to be a, a place of resiliency. And oddly enough, um, today's uh, scripture reading for myself was James chapter one. And in that entire chapter, you're, you're reading about the resiliency of your faith and how it makes you stronger. So for you to mention that as a, a setback, it really was a setup for a comeback later on in the marriage where you can lean on that power. Uh, Francis, what was your experience like being being a dad and, and, and dealing with all of what comes with new fatherhood? Right. Now, as Rochelle mentioned, I come from a large family. Um, you know, my mom and dad had six in a 10 year period. Uh, so my mother always used to joke that she was pregnant from 1967 to 1977. <laughs> um, but essentially, it's what, you know, it's what it was. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I was OK to have our, our kids as quickly as possible. Um, I'd always wanted to be a father. Um, I think the challenge for me again was being a little older, 39, when we had our first, is that I'm watching as my friends and my siblings are getting married, having kids, and I'm just the uncle. Um, you, and you, know, you want that for yourself because it's how you see yourself. Um, but it isn't until you find that person, you know, again, God's timing. Uh, right. And my prayer was for the virtuous woman. Uh, you can look that up uh, if you need to. And it describes exactly what I was looking for. And I was willing to be patient until I found her. Um, then I had to be patient uh, with having kids. But once that happened, it was life changing. Uh, it's no longer about us. It's about you know just she and I. It's about now a team of three. Uh, and very quickly it was five. Um, and the joke often is that you know you go from playing man to man when you got two kids, and then you're playing zone when you got three. Right. Uh, now you're outnumbered. Um, and so, you know, having two in diapers, you know, in a five-year period, we had two in diapers over that entire time, pretty much. As one got out, we had another one. But yeah, I, I loved it. You know, I think it's a, it's a precious time. And now that they're a little bit older, you know, you look back at those days and you kind of reflect on them. And I miss them from time to time. Right. But it was, it was, it was a special, precious time, and I embraced it. So, so as a dad, what would you share? from a strategy or some steps that you might have taken, because I'm sure in just my own personal experience, my level of patience increased overnight having children and it altered my personality. So these fathers that may be listening with new babies on the way, can you share some expectations just based on your own experience so they can kind of hear you and take a deep breath and say, okay, all right, it won't be that bad. <laughs> yeah. And I think every child is different, but the thing that I think is consistent is that kids want structure. Mm. They want structure. Um, and you have to be willing to put that structure in place and then not feel bad about enforcing it when your expectations aren't met. Um, with my boys, I use the three Ds, disrespect, disobedience, and dishonesty. Mm. So then if they get in trouble, one of those three things happen. And then we'll have a conversation. Um, but kids are always going to test the waters. They're going to kind of see how far they can go. They're no different. They're like... Small adults, in a sense, like as adults, though, we do the same thing. You know, we want to see sometimes what can we get away with when things are unstructured. Right. So I think to any parent out there who's new 
to, to parenting, uh, put some structures in place. But your kids also want to know that when they mess up, that they have a safe place to land. Wow. They have to know that mistakes are going to come. And when I make one, my parent doesn't love me any less. And the consequence of the discipline that comes with it is not out of anger or disappointment. It's out of correction. But I want you to become this person that I know that you can be. Right. Um, that's for me, I think those are probably the, the, the two. Now, now let's go back to these three Ds again. Disrespect, disobedience, dishonesty. And dishonesty. Man, that's hey, that's a master class right there. Michelle, <laughs> what would you say, you know, from the from the from the mother role in terms of the collaboration? Because I think that's something that's usually missed. I'm I'm hearing that you both came together and had shared parental values and views. So that structure had to start with the marital system before it funneled down into the parenting system. Can Rochelle talk about how you and Francis came together to negotiate and navigate that collective parenting before you began to implement those strategies? So you know what? It's it's challenging to see what you're going to be like as a parent until you actually become a parent. Right. <laughs> Philip and I, our parenting styles are very much alike. We are both, we both came from families where there was discipline, but there was love, right? It was that combination. And uh, so we try to, like Philip said, instill that same core values in our family. Um, you know, we, we work together. We, you know, we set the, you know, whatever the policy, not the policies, like, I mean, you can call it policies, the, yeah. the limit, it's right? Uh -huh, yeah. Right. We set the expectations for mm -hmm. the kids. And I think that we're, we're very much the same. So the kids don't try to play us against each other. Our parenting style, our expectations are the same. Where I see uh, a lot of parents uh, play the good cop, bad cop role. Mm. And when you do that, I feel like you kind of set the children up a little bit for failure. Um, but Philip and I are on one accord as we discipline. So we we try to make sure that we once we discipline, we step back, we talk to one another about it. What do you think? We share with each other, hey, I think you might have come across, you know, a little bit too much, or maybe we could have done it this way. So we really try to communicate with one another First. and try to be receptive, as challenging as that is, right? Yeah. To try to take yeah. that little bit of constructive criticism that, but we're all working towards the same goal, and that's to produce healthy, happy, you know, loving children. And, and I think what's important too is that when we discipline the kids in front of each other, even if there's I might disagree with something that she says or does, or she may disagree with something I do or say. We don't ever talk about it in front of the kids. Correct. It'll be after gotcha. whatever happens, happens. So the decision was made. It is what it is. And then we get together and when we talk about it. If there's some disagreement, we'll, we take that into consideration for the next time. Right. Um, and, and to so go you present a, uni a unity in front of the children. A unified front, right. And as far as the kids, we let them know, you know, we, your weaknesses are exposed in this house. So everybody knows what everybody struggles with. And we let them know, hey, we're not going to use that as a weakness where you're going to, uh, you know, tease or, you know, talk about that or, you know, throw that against somebody. You know, we take that up in prayer every night and we want to know like, hey, we're a community. We're a team here. This is Team Francis. And so this is a safe place. And we want to make sure that everybody feels free to express themselves and be themselves. And we're going to pray for whatever each one of us needs. Man, I'm going to share this and I'm going to put it out there. Out of all of your many talents, I'm I'm seeing a uh, uh, This is Francis podcast in the future for you both because <laughs> You guys are putting on a master class when it comes to marriage, but also in parenting and coming together. Um, I love what you talked about with the three Ds, um, disrespect, discipline, dishonesty. Um, I hope I got those right just now. Disrespect, yeah. dishonesty, and disobedience. And disobedience, definitely. So, I mean, everything you're putting out, I'm picking up. It's great. I want to segue and change gears a little bit. Um, and, and just for those listening, uh, Francis, I, I've known you going on, I want to say about 14 years now, if not longer. Um, yeah, 14, 14 years. And oh, no. I've got to witness from a from a friend perspective some of your trials and tribulations that you've gone through. Uh, but one in particular that stands out was when you had back surgery. And a lot of listeners, they may be going through a physical element where their partner has to show what it's like to be there within sickness and health. Can you share about the experience and, and, and you know, really, really give the listeners an opportunity to understand how that shaped or that season shaped your marriage 
and, and what that looked like and how you guys were able to prevail through that back surgery season. Yeah, I, I did have spine surgery in spring of 2015. Um, and to go back a few months prior to that, I had been working, I, I was in education for a while before we started the uh, our logistics company. Um, and I was working at a charter school, long story short, um, they had to make some cuts and a position that I had moved to Indianapolis for got cut along with 25 other positions. Um, shortly after that, I end up with, a, I'd had a back issue. Um, it got worse and I ended up having to have the surgery. So I ended up over a course of, uh, goodness, the surgery was in April because we didn't leave until September. So it was about six months, um, from the back surgery to the time that I was kind of back working. Um, but it was difficult. Um, so you've got three kids at that point who are one, almost three, and almost five. Wow. And a husband who's bedridden. Mm. So Rochelle's got to take care of four of us and has to go to work because I'm not working. Mm. So that's when you find out if your wife wears a cape or not. She had the S on her, on the on the, on the chest and the cape on her shoulders. Uh, but she carried the team. Uh, and when you've got a wife who doesn't now see you as a burden, but sees this as an opportunity for us to strengthen our marriage, and we still are going to church, we're praying over everything, uh, it makes a difference. Because it's it's really easy, and again, I'm a, from a man's perspective, to say, I'm not working and I'm hurt. So I can't be a provider and I can't help do anything around the house because of this issue that I've had with this surgery. Uh, and it can take a lot out of you. But when you've got someone who's supporting you and not making you feel less than because of these things going on, it's it changes everything. So it was a season that I would never want to repeat again. I'll say that. Yeah, but if I had to do it again, it would be with her. Amen. Wow, that's beautiful because I, I love hearing you describe your wife because you're giving her the flowers that she rightfully deserves. But one of the things that really stood out, and this is a testament of, of your wife's love for you. I, I heard you say you never felt like she made you feel guilty. She didn't belittle the situation. She continued to keep faith. Uh, Rochelle, I'm, I'm sure that was unbearable at times. It, it was extremely hard for the people listening. Help us understand how you continue to keep your faith as high as it was, what what did you lean on to, to fill you up? Because as a caretaker, we can empty ourselves out, but we have to be able to fill ourselves back up. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So um, you, I don't know if you knew this, but there was another emergency going on at that time. Our youngest son, Justin, was having aspiration pneumonia and un unbeknownst to us and ended up having to go through surgery, have a G2 put in. So we were dealing with lots of <laughs> medical issues at that time. Wow. Um, thank God, I'm an occupational therapist by trade. So I work with uh, adults with any type of challenge from hip surgery, back surgery. So I really, first of all, uh, was able to lean on my staff at work and to be able to have any type of equipment that I needed to bring in for Philip, whether it was something, right, the TENS unit for electrical stimulation, uh, uh, reacher, socket, anything that would help him keep as much independence as he could possibly have. And I know that that was very important for him. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a blessing. And then of course, first and foremost, there was fasting and praying and praying and fasting, right? Because some miracles only come through fasting and praying. So I think my relationship with the Lord, the church that we were going to at the time, just really poured into me, getting up those early mornings, nursing my younger son, and then just spending time with the Lord uh, really gave me perspective. The Lord was speaking to me at that time, telling me, you know what, you're not going to be in this for long, but remember, remember this season that you're in right now, like don't ever forget it. You know, and I always kind of attribute uh, uh, Philip's situation to that of Joseph. Like he didn't ask for that, right? He didn't ask to be put in that situation. But unbeknownst to us, the Lord was humbling. The Lord was preparing for such a time as this. So we thank God for that. that, that that's even, through the, a... even through the trials, right? Yeah, you did. You you, you earned it. <laughs> you definitely earned it. And, yeah, and, you know, have its perfect work, right? Yeah, and, 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 and that's the whole point of this show, right? Marriage Underdog, to be able to hear 
the tenacity, the the grit, the grind. When everything was pointed against you, you both prevailed and you stayed together. And not only did you not break, but you became stronger through the process. And that's really what marriage is about, the journey, the process of getting better and better and better. And you came together and you still were able to be that representation and you never wavered on your faith. And, and that that's you know, something I want to segue into because a lot of the couples I interview are in business together. So give us an idea around the transformation to leave two great corporate jobs, phenomenal income in terms of uh, security, and you had both been in these industries for a long period of time, and now in logistics, which is completely opposite. So share with us how that happened and what skills you lean on daily to continue to perform as co-providers in the same industry. Okay. So yeah, so I've, I've been in education for 25 years. Uh, and at the time of starting a logistics company, uh, I was a district supervisor uh, in uh, Hillsborough, where I live. Uh, it's eighth largest school district in the country. So it's, it's a big one. Uh, and I was an adjunct professor at the University of Tampa. Um, I was being called to do something different. Um, that I, it was time just to, after 25 years, take a look at something else. And Rochelle and I have talked about starting a business together for a long time. Uh, and this didn't originally start out as a business together. Uh, it started out with me incorporating, starting the business. I had my brother who would come up and he worked with me a few days a week. Then he would go back down uh, to Miami and he did that for a while. Now, the purpose of that was we had faith that this was going to be successful. But at the same time, you want to be cautious. Right. So Rochelle's working full time, making sure that we're going to eat while I'm starting to try to build a business. You had the backup uh, right there still. Yeah. Like, okay. So we needed to make sure that it was going to go. Bring the boat closer to the dock. Bring the boat closer right. to the dock before you jump off of it. Right. Uh, so yeah, it was a big leap of faith because I was leaving the, the best job I felt I'd ever had in education that I enjoyed the most. Um, and people, was like, why are, people were like, why are you leaving something that you, in, you enjoyed that much? It was just a calling that business was out there waiting for me. Uh, and I prayed on the process. And I told God, I said, hey, if this is meant to be, the doors will open, it'll be clear. And one by one, doors just open. And I'm like, I guess I know what I got to do. Right. <laughs> and so, so that was it. So that was how I made the transition originally without Rochelle, as she was making sure that things were, you know, on point at the house. And secondly, when you're building a new business, I was working 16, 18 hours a day sometimes. Wow. Uh, oftentimes, I would take the boys to school in the morning, and then I'd go to work, and I would be working from 10 in the morning and I was getting home sometimes at midnight, mm. uh, one o'clock in the morning. So you gotta be willing to put that grind in. You got to, uh, and you have to be willing to, you have to have to have a partner that understands what you're building to be able to hold it down at the house. That part, because there could have easily been resentment or questions of why are you out so late, but she had given you that trust. Rochelle, right. share about from your experience, what enabled you to provide that level of patience and understanding while Philip was out there doing these 16, 18 hour days and you're home with three children. Right. So again, if you, you know, look back at where we've come from, everything to me really led up to this. So again, how we structure our home, the kids are coming in. I make, you know, making sure that there is a snack there. We're getting our routine, our, our afternoon routine. The kids are well prepared and they're well organized on what life is like right after school, right? So we kind of, you know, tried to run a well oil machine at home. So when we transitioned, it was really no different other than, you know, where is dad? When's he coming home? You know, things like that. So we knew that there was going to be a, a time of sacrifice mm -hmm. where we weren't able to, you know, be together as much, but we were prepared for that. Um, so we knew that eventually it wouldn't be like this. And then as the, the business continued to thrive, we were able to transition and have me go into, into the business with Philip. And I love the fact that it wasn't something that just happened overnight. There was precautions taken to make sure that, Rochelle, you continue to have a consistent income. You also provided Philip with the patience. 
but it sounded like too, Philip, you kept Rochelle in the loop. It was something you did collectively. And then the structure that you'd already had in place in your household made the transition a lot easier as well, because even the kids knew this was a season. So all five of you were on board. Team Francis came together throughout the entire process. It wasn't just dad going out and starting a business. It was the entire family coming mm -hmm. together. Now, I want to segue into another topic, and this is an issue, not necessarily an issue, but this is going to be a season that most married people will go through, especially if you live long enough together, you will see the transition of parents. Mm -hmm. And you both have had that season. And I just want you to share what it looked like to support each other through the transition of parents. Well, I'll speak for myself because my father is our, our most recent grandparent that we've lost in uh, during COVID. So right as COVID was kind of rearing its ugly head, he had gotten sick and then uh, was hospitalized. And then within three weeks, uh, he had passed away, not having any medical conditions, nothing. So it was completely really healthy. He was completely healthy. Completely active. Active. He was pastor, the church, our church, after the church. pastor of our church for over 20 years. Wow. So it really took us by surprise, right? You can imagine. Um, but Philip, again, being the person that he is, our family, you know, he really just wrapped his arms around all of us, right? And we were going to get through it no matter what. So he's always been so loving, so supportive, anything that I've ever needed, uh, time, how can I, how can I help? What can I do, you know, to take the boys off your hands, whatever it was, he is, has always been and was right there by my side, um, loving me and encouraging me and supporting me throughout the entire process. And, and I'm glad you're talking about providing outside of just monetary means. A lot of times when we hear that word providing, especially as couples, we immediately go to money. But you just listed how your husband provided time. He provided attention. He provided love. He provided understanding. He provided additional support. And you use the word, he wrapped his arms around all of us because mm -hmm. it wasn't just a father. It was a grandfather that was being transitioned as well. It was a father-in-law. So when you look at how you described your husband as a provider, I hope that people are listening, especially the men, providing goes well beyond monetary gain. Correct. Francis, um, share your experience with uh, how Rochelle was there with you as you um, witnessed the uh, transition of your mother. All right, so I lost my mom four years prior. So uh, Papa passed in 2020. I lost my mother to ovarian cancer in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have a, a faster transition versus a slower transition of cancer. And sometimes you think that because you know the person is sick and that it's eventually going to happen, that you can better prepare. That's not true at all, mm -hmm. um, but you think in your mind. So we knew in 2014 that she was stage four and that the average life expectancy based on where she was, was about two years. Mm -hmm. So you try to kind of prepare yourself knowing that 2016 is coming at some point. And she became that statistic of two years. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I'm first let me say I'm thankful that my mother had a chance to, to get to know Rochelle and them to meet my boys. They were younger. So they remember Papa more so than they remember, remember my mom because of the age difference. You know, right. my youngest was had just turned two at the time. So the nice. boys were two, four, and six. Um, but it was it was difficult. Uh, and some of the things that, and I, I thank you for what you shared, uh, same way, I was very, very close to my mother. Uh, and it was, a, it was a tragic, it was a devastating loss for me. But having a wife that is there to support, again, to hold you, that you know that you can cry on her shoulder and not feel like you you know you're being a softy. You know some guys are like they don't cry. If I can, if I'm gonna get emotional, I'm emotional. That's mama right there. That's different. Yeah. That's a whole yeah. different level. So I understand. That's mama. That's so you know I'm I was was thankful just to have her there to do those exact same things for me. And even now, you know, you know this is why I'm thankful for technology today. They didn't get a chance to see my mom a lot. But they get to see her all the time now because we have all the videos, we have all the oh, pictures. Wow, so special. they'll see something, they'll do something. And then my my mom used to cook, she used to cook, 
And so Rochelle actually learned some of her recipes. Oh. You know, and she'll say, you know, tonight I'm gonna, we used to call my, my mother Shushu. Um, tonight I'm gonna make Shushu's, you know, meatballs, whatever it is. Uh, so she's not with us, but Rochelle actually plays a role in keeping her here with us. So oh, that's man. what I appreciate. And, and that's beautiful to make sure that people are hearing that, right? The, the spirit of the person can live on through different cultural experiences such as cooking meals and, and sharing recipes. And like you mentioned with technology and allowing that love and that connection to not wither away with the person. And you're able to share that with your children so they can have a, a, a secondary experience as well. Wow, um, this has been phenomenal. I, I mean, you guys, I, I said it earlier, I could definitely see you guys having your own podcast, your own show. Uh, you, you, you've just done so much together, and you've really been a blessing to all the listeners today. And I want to just, you know, ask you in closing, how can people connect with you on social or any projects that you have going on or events partic um, primarily to church? I, I just really... And, and, and putting it out there, I could definitely see you guys as as world leaders when it comes to being spokespersons for marriage and, and parenting and entrepreneurship. It's just been a pleasure to have you. So, how can um, people connect with you in a casual setting on social, or um, if you if you feel free to share any of that information? I only have a I have a Facebook page, <laughs> and I and. Uh, and I think that's all I got. I'd probably say connect with Philip. I'm on Facebook, but I, I really don't do a lot of posting. Yeah. But maybe that's something that we will look into in the yeah. future. And, and as we're <laughs> and as we're talking about things that we do feel that we'll be able to share with others and possibly be a blessing to others, uh, as we enter those uh, social media platforms, I'll share them with you uh, so that we can go ahead and get them. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I hope to have you guys back on again. This has been phenomenal. And um, for those that are listening, you, you tuned into Marriage Underdogs Radio Show. I'm your host, Chris A. Matthews. Please like, subscribe to the uh, podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And once again, I would just like to thank Philip and Francis, Philip and Rochelle Francis again for for being guests. And um, hopefully, this episode was a blessing to you all listening, as it was to me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chris. You.